because I just can spell it the other way around. Uh, yes, and this is joint work, um, meaning that I didn't do most of it. Um, <laughs> Uh, ben Sheldon is from the zoology department, or department of zoology. Uh, and he has provided some of the zoological motiv motivation and data. Um, Yanis and Steve uh, achieved most of the uh, legwork. And out of these four names, the one you'll probably you're more likely to recognize is Steve's. And you may have trouble seeing this picture of Steve in the bottom right, from Max in 2007. Uh, although the conferences tend to be very well organized, there's always those elements beyond our control, right? The, the external circumstance. Um, this week has been going very well, but a couple days ago we had that fire alarm in the early hours of the morning. And maybe some of us have had nightmares of being chased by delicious cookies. But in Maxon 2007 in Saratoga Springs, do you remember what the problem was during the postal session? The lights went out, so we had, we had power cut. Yeah, and you proved the quality of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do yeah, power cut. Uh, so there was a chunk of the poster session in Max in 2007 where Steve was the only one who could see the posters because he's shining a light attached to his head here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he had a lamp in his pocket. So. A one-page summary of networks, because I talk is about um, breaking networks up into uh, communities. Here in the upper right, we've got a network with eight nodes or vertices uh, connected by ten links or edges. And you can summarize that in an adjacency matrix. So if there are capital N vertices, it's an N by N matrix, which describes who's connected to who. And the elements of capital V can be Boolean, so you're either connected or not, or they can denote some connection weight. If you take a row or column of capital V, you've got a connectivity profile. But more important for this presentation, if you sum up over that connectivity profile, you get a degree, small k, uh, for a node. And if this is an undirected network, then you just have one degree. If you have directions, if you have arrows on those links, then you'll have an in degree and a negative degree. So, an example graph um, with n nodes connected to each other, each with the same probability, small p, um, in, independent of whether or not you're connected to nodes already. Uh, then it's easy to calculate each node has a degree of um, p times n minus 1. And you can think of an ensemble of vector probable graphs. Given m, the number of edges, you've got this. Um, of equal probability amongst all the graphs. And the degree distribution is binomial. Most people looking into networks these days are more interested in large networks, maybe millions of nodes. Um, and for large n, you can approximate that as a fossil, of course. Mm -hmm. this, this example we've gone through here is an important one. It's called an erdish rindy random graph. We'll come back to it later when we're comparing real graphs to their um, random network. Here on the right, we've got uh, that sort of Erdős-Rényi graph. And on the left, you've got its opposite. You've got a completely structured sort of crystal. Um, and of course, real networks are, are neither of these. Here's an example of a real network. It's based on scientific collaboration in a particular community, networks community. Uh, and you can see it's kind of clumpy. Originally, this graph would have been colored all the same, so all black nodes. But if you run a community detection algorithm on it, you can color the nodes based on what community they, they belong to. So for example, on the far left, we've got a red community, but maybe uh, people interacting with each other uh, more than the rest of the group, maybe working on a particular topic within networks. These community detection algorithms tend to be um, creating disjoint communities. But our algorithm book is one of the ones that creates overlapping we came across the power laws in previous presentations. Uh, in the networks context, it means that very many nodes have just a few links, and a few nodes or hubs would have a large number of links. Um, a second property is the small world effect. You 
see this a lot in the real networks. Um, transitivity, uh, which means here something slightly different from what we heard earlier in the week. Uh, if um, A is a friend of B and B is a friend of C, then A may be a friend of C. You can see these triangles a lot in real networks. And the six degrees of separation should be familiar. Uh, it's been known for many decades. It became popular more from the 1960s onwards with this research by the psychologist Stan Milgram, who said if you pick any two random people in the world, on average, and if you make certain assumptions about what it means for two humans to be connected, then on average these two random people will be six degrees of separation apart. Of course, it could be much more. It could be a nomad in Turkmenistan and a nomad in the Andes. It's probably going to be more than six. And also, the world's population has doubled since the 60s, so we may have to make a small adjustment to these numbers. A third and final property, uh, most important, is community structure. There isn't much agreement about what it means to be a community within the network, but roughly it's regions of increased connectivity. So a node is more likely to interact with its um, fellow community members than other nodes elsewhere in the network. Uh, so finding communities is a bit like a clustering problem. And some examples from real world networks, uh, these could be a cluster of friends, or it could be a group of proteins. Um, and they tend to represent also functional modules. So maybe this group of proteins interacting is achieving some known function within the body, for example. Uh, you could represent this with a stochastic block model, um, take capital P. If there are k communities, then you've got a k by k matrix, which you can think of uh, as a sort of Markov chain moving around with this transition matrix P. And of course, if you go along the diagonal of the matrix, you'll get larger elements uh, based on what we were saying in the previous slide. So you tend to interact more in your own community. Uh, so in community detection, you can take this n by n matrix and break it down into a bipartite, um, sort of a bipartite to a graph, a sort of table of which nodes belong to communities. So here you say communities, um, community one, made of nodes 1 to 5, community 2 is made of nodes, say, 5 to 10. So you have this simple map here. And this is the case of overlapping communities, because 5 has this foot and bolt count. But uh, there are a few problems. Um, well, first of all, it's not quite graph partitioning, because we don't know a priori the number of communities we're looking for necessarily. Um, a bigger problem, we don't have the ground truth, uh, because of that lack of universal agreement I mentioned before. We have the issue of quality functions. Um, there are different ways of measuring how good your uh, community detection was. And uh, finally, it's uh, an NP hard problem, which we're familiar with anyone who's worked with partition. So I mentioned that quality function problem. The most common is the Newman German modularity. Um, the key idea is that a good grouping will be the one that yields statistically surprising. Density, so above what you'd expect with the random graph, so more function. Mm. Um, and we, w we won't go through this modularity, um, but in brief, you get points, you get positive points for interactions within a community. So if you assign two nodes to the same community and they have to be interacting, and you get penalized, um, this is sort of like subtracting off the arbitrary random graph, you get penalized. Um, for, for, for random connections that are signed with um, So this, this slide is better. It's a nutshell. In a nutshell, what's going on, the modularity goes from minus 1 to 1. It never quite reaches 1, but it, you can get quite close to it. And real-world networks go between 0.3 and 0.7. So they're, they're, it's, it's rare to find 1, 0 on a pretty random graph. Most of this has been said before. Another problem with modularity is that it tends to favor uh, solutions with a small number of communities. So it's by no means a perfect um, account of how good your communities are. And it's important to say that later on we'll be calculating um, modularity. Uh, so here's an example of another network. Um, 
thanks to um, my supporter also at August group. This is uh, committees, which are squares and subcommittees, which are circles within the 108 um, US um, House of Representatives. Uh, and you can see it, it, um, that uh, it, they're, 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 you have this sort of bunch of these properties. So, for example, committees and subcommittees, so the ways and means you connect them by looking at how many, how much overlap you have in the membership of those two subcommittees. So you have a strong relationship with a lot of overlap. Um, again, this is a disjoint algorithm, so you get disjoint communities, um, and it doesn't allow for overlap, um, which is not realistic. And also, it doesn't provide any measure of participation strength. So, can you belong to maybe 80% in one group and 20% in another group? Now we come to um, our approach for dealing with that, non-negative matrix factorization, which um, took off in the 1990s. Here's the general representation of that. Um, where V is going to be F by N, of course, the network is going to be N by N. And you say that your observed matrix V comes from an expectation matrix, a generator matrix, uh, V hat, which can be decomposed into product of two matrices, W and H. An ill post problem, of course, the constraints we put on it are that W and H um, are non negative. And that non negativity is useful if you want a part space representation. So, uh, Lee and Sung um, had this nice um, comparison with principal component analysis. Uh, those of you who've dealt with um, image processing with PCA, you know that you can break down, if you have, a, say, a, a database of faces, you can break that down into eigenfaces. Um, and some of the eigenfaces look a bit like what you're after, but many of them don't have an intuitive explanation. Uh, but because of this non-negativity constraint in NMF, we have a parts-based representation, as I was saying. So you can see the different bits and pieces here. They do correspond to the heavy to it me. You can see mouths, you can see the left eye here, the right eye here, the counter asymmetries of the face, and so on. Um, so in networks, those parts-based, those, those parts <coughs> are the communities. Uh, we achieve a certain compression uh, because going from an n by n matrix to just two matrices, each n by k, um, if you add up the total number of elements you're dealing with, it's a small number, of course. Um, very briefly, those elements in the matrix, they come from a, a Poisson distribution, but we'll come back to that. Um, so the factorization of our generator matrix V is into W and H um, to an inner NK. And the communities are treated as latent objects. And the key point is that the individuals are expected to interact based on their mutual participation in the same communities. So there is a certain circularity there. That, um, a noble belong to a community. Well, what is that community? Well, it's, it's, um, it's the group that has these nodes. Now we're trying to solve two problems at the same time because, um, like I was saying, in partitioning, we know what K is. Here we've got to infer. So it's sort of like a model order reflection <coughs> problem. Um, and at the same time, we're trying to determine what W and H are. So we go through these um, iterative equations. Uh, we'll update W and H, and then we'll update K. And we'll, this um, diagram you'll see in the abstract for the talk, and it's our graphical model of how how that's set up. So there's our, um, el our elements interacting. They are based on uh, the matrices capital W and capital H, um, which are fed by um, prior beta, uh, which is fed by hyper um, priors A and B, hyper priors A and B. Um, going into that in a bit more detail, uh, we're looking to maximize uh, the probability of W, H, and beta, which we're iterating over, given our observed uh, data matrix B. So this is the joint probability for all four, and then this is probably this W, H, and beta. And if you ignore the um, normalization constant, you can express it as uh, varying with the product of uh, four factors. And we'll go into each of those in turn. 
uh, the first selection function, that is the probability of being given W and H. You can take as a product over um, all of the elements. And so here you've got uh, just an example Poisson distributions, because um, we assume that if you know what W and H are, so if you, which will give you the Poisson parameters, then uh, they will follow um, Poisson distribution. And then the second and third factors are priors on W and H, so that's this column here. Um, and we give them half normal distributions. So um, we're not the first to do this. We um, get this idea from Kant and Bob and others. Um, so these will represent the precision of this half normal distribution. And these act as sort of um, shrink shrinkage parameters so that naturally these is when they get um, very high, so very high precision, and get very narrow um, half normal distribution. When they go below a certain threshold, you can just remove that part. So that k can get smaller and smaller and smaller. So naturally, you arrive at a reasonable k. So this is a, not the most basic way of doing it. Um, it's, uh, it's aimed at computational efficiency. When you have um, large networks, then um, that's a, a real consideration. But uh, people have tried something similar with um, um, variation. And then finally, the hyperparameters on beta are soon to be fixed. So the scale and shape parameter on gamma, which is um, the maximum prior. And then even some sample gamma distributions. So going back to that um, equation with the four factors, if you take the log, uh, and this is make it a cost function, so put minuses in front, uh, we've got these four terms now. And this is what we want to minimize under the constraints of non-negativity. Uh, spelling those four terms out more completely, uh, so that this is from the probability of B given W and H, these are the priors on W and H, and this is the um, uh, hyper, hyper priors. So the method we take is uh, from Kenneth Bobbish, I think it should be 2009, because it's more recent than that. Um, and it's an automatic uh, relevance determination. So we result in an estimate for our generator matrix uh, to be broken down to WH. Now, I mentioned that B could be um, <coughs> representing an undirected or a directed graph. And of course, if it's an undirected graph, B will be symmetric. And in that case, W and H would be just transposed. Uh, but our method is generalizable to direct graphs, so W and H not have to um, trans transpose of each other. Uh, so th the answer that we get out of this is if you look at the W and the H, um, and if you look row by row, you've got the participation strength for a given node um, in a given community. And it doesn't have to be a sort of vector quantization be maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.7, 0, 0, 0, 0. So maybe wrong in two communities, 30 and 70 percent. Uh, so to go through an example with this network here, 16 nodes, where the connection strength between two nodes is a solid line if it's strong, a dashed line if it's medium, and a dotted line if it's weak. You can kind of see that this might form a community here, it might have another community here, another one here, and there's also something going on around here. So how is that divided up into communities? Well, these are three different techniques from the literature, extreme optimization, spectrum partitioning, and W percolation. And they come up with different answers. The first two are disjoint methods. Um, they have some agreement, but they think node 6 through 13 should be divided in different ways. And W chip percolation, like our method, has the advantage of that you can belong to multiple communities. So node 6, for example, quite central here, it belongs to um, three communities. But the W chip percolation method doesn't tell you to what extent he belongs to each of those. It just says he belongs. Uh, 
explaining it another way, community one up here in the upper left, uh, community two in the middle, community three in the upper right, and community four in the lower right. And I said our answer is W. This is a, this is a nice way of explaining W. So the x-axis here is what community number you are, and the y-axis is your node index, 1 to 16. And you see, if you remember that uh, nodes 1 to 5 are sort of in a cluster here, and there's nodes 1 to 5, they're all strongly associated with um, the single community number 1. And node 6 is kind of across the board. And here we zoom in on 6 a bit. You see he, his EMF has a higher entropy than most others. So he is first and foremost in community 2, and to a lesser extent he's in community 1 and 3. And just going back, there's number 6. So he's mostly in community 2, and you think about it, he is quite an important player in community 2. But he also he seems to play a role, playing a role in number 1 and number 3. <coughs> So I mentioned that six had um, higher entropy. You can, you can show that when you, if you're generating artificial graphs, that you can, you can show how the entropy increases as you're more and more likely in an artificial graph to be connected to nodes outside of your community. So it gets harder and harder to determine who's in what community as that entropy goes up. Uh, the graph on the left is um, a graph of normalized mutual information, which is a metric of comparing uh, two partitions. So I mentioned that some of the methods disagreed on how they divide up into communities. If you want to compare them quantitatively, you can use this NMI. And if you have Newman German random graphs, a particular type of random graph um, with 128 nodes in it, then you have a ground truth in that choice problem. And you can compare your communities to the uh, real answer. And so you want normalized mutual information to be one. Of course, as the graph gets fuzzier and fuzzier, so as you start connecting more and more to nodes outside of your own community, you expect that to drop because the input problem becomes harder and harder. And one nice thing about our method is it's one of the methods that maintains a high NMI um, per row. So things like spectral partitioning or hierarchical clustering will fall um, much more rapidly. So now we're comparing our method to two others, extreme optimization and the Lumen method, which came out just two or three years ago. And these two methods um, are aiming at maximizing modularity, the Newman German modularity I mentioned before, whereas ours is not. Ours is, um, is not at all calculating modularity. And yet it's interesting that we get almost the same modularity results. We never do quite as well, that's to be expected, it's not quite a fair comparison. Um, these are eight different databases. And if we can zoom in for a moment on the first one just to give a flavor of what's going on, we have 62 dolphins interacting. Uh, so some um, uh, zoologist has determined the interaction strength of these, evolved, of these dolphins for us. The Louvain method uh, has divided it into one, two, three, four, five communities. And in our case, we have just four. One, two, two, and what's different is these six nodes here that the Levan method said were a community. And I think just visually you kind of take issue with that. Is it really a community? It's hard to say. Um, instead, we just say for each of those six nodes, we divide them up amongst the other communities. So for example, this node here belongs a bit to the red community, a little bit to the pink, a little bit to the blue, and quite a lot to the green. And that's based on its interactions with those other nodes. Mm -hmm. So hence we have a soft partition. Uh, some references. And thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Sure. I had uh, one question. Uh, you mentioned the uh, entropy of the distribution. Uh, yes, here. Uh, one, one more forward, actually. Um, I'm slightly confused. If we're allowing um, 
m multiple membership? Is that really an entropy, or does it fail to be well normalized? I, could you have something that is, it, do the probabilities you have there have to sum to one, or? Uh, yes, that's a good point, thank you. Um, the Ws are initially not constrained to sum to one, but at the end of it, we create this sort of intermediate variable pi, which um, is W over the sum of the Ws in the row. Yeah, thank you, I missed that. All right. Um, if no one minds, I actually have another question as well. Is I, this? It, it, it's all very interesting from a phenomenological perspective. But have you motivated this from the perspective of like a toy model of agent uh, of um, social agents and what they might do? Like try to build it up from a, um, some sort of a toy model that would produce a random graph that. Or a random communities. Uh, yeah, we have played around a bit with generating um, random communities, yes. Um, but it's difficult because there isn't sort of a universal model for doing that. In different communities, um, you have four types of network, uh, social, um, technological, information, and um, biological. And even within that, you can you have sort of subtypes, and they have their different sort of generative um, Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I always like to see new applications and things. Um, but one point that occurs to me, as the technology, the numerical technology of doing these things gets better, you see them as you're developing, do you find sort of subtle things happening, like multi-phase problems? Can you get, are you able to find places where they can be quite distinct, but equally valid patterns of clustering? Because, you know, there's no, compl no automatic complexity in these digital problems. So there's almost the possibility, at least in theory, having multi-phase problems would be really challenging. Yes, you mean by multi-phase, you mean like from percolation theory. Yeah, I mean, can it be this yeah. or this? Yes, um, I haven't looked at too many percolation graphs myself, but I suppose when you have a case of hierarchical networks, then that's probably the best chance for um, multiple phases. Yeah, but I haven't looked into that yet. How sensitive is the clustering result depending on the hyperparameters alpha and uh, beta? So, oh, I haven't done a sensitive analysis. Let me change F A to B on the beta. Yeah. Uh, do you think of anything in particular? particular yeah, you have to assume some value, and it would be very interesting how strongly this affects the result. Yeah. Yeah. I was. Yes, I wasn't. Um, that's a good question that I should pass on to Jens, actually. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, when I see uh, some of those uh, pictures you presented in the networks, uh, it brings to my mind uh, a well-known mathematical problem where you have dots, some of them connected, some are not. And all the connections you can think of uh, as of roads, uh, I believe the problem is called the postal worker problem. So he has to start with, at one point, he has to visit all points and come back. You can assign weight on the, you know, the road because if he starts with heavy bag and you know, he has to decide where to go. So you have to come up with some kind of uh, intuitive uh, guidelines or principles or you know, something like that. I was wondering if that's very interesting. We hadn't thought about applying this technique to something like the Chinese Postal Control or the TSP. Um, but I wonder if communities could form an intermediate step in that problem, communities of houses, um, just sort of a divide and conquer approach for that, which is another um, empty hard problem. Um, in the context of something like active sampling, um, with this, could you sort of, if, if you imagine all these links are simply the links you've observed so far, um, you get some sort of community structure out of it. 
could you say what the value of observing whether there's a potential link between two of the nodes is in terms of how much more information you get about the community structure that way? Does that come out reasonably easily? Interesting. Yes, we've only assumed that, yeah, what we see is what we got. Um, you have a certain type of network. You have uh, associativity problems uh, where you can look at other dimensions going on at the same time. So the characteristics of the nodes themselves. But at the moment, the only characteristics we looked at are uh, from the adjacency. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, we'll thank our speaker once more. Thank you very much.